come, my people. Enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Chapter 1. Wherein the literal and real importance of the text is considered. The doctrine propounded, and the method of the following discourse stated. Man, being a prudent and prospecting creature, can never be satisfied with present safety, except he may also see himself well secured against future dangers. Upon all appearance of trouble, it is natural for him to seek a refuge that he may be able to shun what he is loath to suffer, and survive those calamities which will ruin the defenseless and expose multitude. Natural men seek refuge in natural things. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as an high wall, in his own conceit, Proverbs 18, verse 11. Hypocrites make lies a refuge, and under falsehood do they hide themselves, Isaiah 28, verse 15. Not doubting, but they shall stand dry and safe when the overflowing flood lays all others under water. But godly men make God himself their hiding place. To him they have still betaken themselves in all ages, as often as calamities have befallen the world, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. His chickens run under the wings of the hen for safety when the kite hovers over to them. So do they fly to their God for sanctuary. Psalm 56, verse 3. At what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Lord, if a storm of trouble at any time overtake me, I will make bold to come under thy roof for shelter. And indeed, it is not presumptuous, but you are welcome. It is no presumption in them after so gracious an invitation from their God. Come, my people, enter into your chambers. My friends, a sound of trouble is in our ears. The clouds gather and blacken upon us more and more. Distress of nations with perplexity seems to be near. Our day hastens to an end, and the shadows of the night are stretching forth upon us. What greater service, therefore, can I do for your souls than by the light of this scripture? as with a candle in my hand to lead you to your chambers and show you your lodgings and the attributes and promises of God, before I take my leave of you and bid you good night. Oh, with what satisfaction should I part with you, were I but sure to leave you under Christ's wings. It was Christ's lamentation over Jerusalem that they should not be gathered under his wings when the Roman eagle was ready to hover over that city. And you know how dear they paid for their obstinacy and infidelity. Be warned by that dreadful example, and among the rest of your mercies, bless God heartily for this, that so sweet a voice sounds from heaven in your ears this day, this day of frights and troubles. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and so on. This chapter contains a lovely song fitted for the lips of God's Israel, notwithstanding their sad captivity. For their God was with them in Babylon and cheered their hearts there with many promises of deliverance. And in the mystical sense it relates to the New Testament churches of whose troubles, protections, and deliverance the Jews in Babylon were a type. This chapter, though full of excellence and seasonable truths, will be too long to analyze. It shall suffice to search back only to the 17th verse where you find a poor, captivated church under despondency of mind, comparing her condition to that of a woman in travail, who has many sharp pains and bitter throes, yet cannot be delivered. Much like that in Second Kings 19, verse 3, the children are come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring forth. Against this discouragement, a double relief is applied in the following verses. The one is a promise of full deliverance at last the other an invitation into a sure sanctuary and place of defense for the present until the time of their full deliverance came. The promise we have in verse 19, Your dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise, awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust. Their captivity was a civil death, and Babylon is a grave to them. So it is elsewhere described in Ezekiel 31, 1-3 and 14. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And therefore their deliverance is carried under the notion of a resurrection in that promise. Objection. 
Yea, might they reply, the hopes of deliverance at last has some comfort. But alas, that may be far off. How shall we subsist until then? Solution. Well enough. For as you have in that promise a sure ground of deliverance at last, so in the interim here is a gracious invitation into a place of security for the present. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, in which invitation four things call for our close attention. One. The form of the invitation including in it the qualified subject. Come, my people, God's own peculiar people who have chosen God for their protection and resigned up themselves sincerely to him in the covenant are the persons here invited, the same which he before called the righteous nation that kept the truth. Verse 2. He means those that remained faithful to God as many of them did in Babylon, witness their sorrow for Zion. Psalm 137 per totem, and their solemn appeal to God that their hearts were not turned back nor had their steps declined, though they were sore broken in a place of dragons, and covered with the shadow of death. Psalm 44, verse 18, 19, and 20. These are the people invited to the chambers of security, and a form of invitation is full of tender compassion. Come, my people, like a tender father who sees a storm coming upon his children in the fields, and takes them by the hand, saying, Come away, my dear children, hasten home with me, lest the storm overtake you. Or as the Lord said to Noah before the deluge, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And God shut him in. Genesis 7 verses 1 and 16. This is a form of invitation. Come, my people. Number two, the privilege invited to enter thou into thy chambers. There is some variety and indeed variety rather than contrariety in the exposition of these words. In this, all are agreed that by their chambers is not meant the chambers of their own houses, Ezekiel 21, verse 14. For alas, their houses were left unto them desolate, and if not, yet they could be no security to them now, when neither their own houses nor their fortified city was able to defend them before. Grotius expounds it of the grave, and makes these chambers the same with the chambers of death. The grave indeed is a place of security, where God sometimes hides some of his people in troublesome times. This is plain in Isaiah 57, 1 and 2, but I cannot allow this to be the sense of this text. God does not comfort his captives with a natural against a civil death, but with protection in their troubles upon earth, as is evident from the scope of the whole chapter. By chambers, therefore, others understand the chambers of divine providence, where the saints are hid in evil days. So are annotators on this place, and no doubt, but this is in part the special intent of the text. Others understand the attributes and promises of God to be here meant, as well as his providence. And I conceive all three make the sense of the text full. The divine attributes engaged in the promises when exercised are actuated in the providences of God. He serves the sanctuaries and refuges of God's people in days of trouble. John Calvin understands it of the quiet repose of the believer's mind in God, but that is rather the effect of his security than the place of it. It is God's attributes or his name, which is the same thing, to which the righteous fly and are safe. Proverbs 18, verse 10. Objection. But you will say, why are they called their chambers? Those attributes are not theirs, but God's. Solution. The answer is easy. Though they be God's properties, yet they are his people's privileges and benefits. For when God makes over himself to them in covenant to be their God, he does as a word deliver to them the keys of all of his attributes for their benefit and security, and is as if he should say, My wisdom is yours, to contrive for your good. My power is yours, to protect your persons. My mercy is yours to forgive your sins. My all-sufficiency is yours to supply your wants. All that I am and all that I have is for your benefit and comfort. These are the chambers provided for the saints' lodgings, and into these they are invited to enter. Enter thou into thy chambers. By entering into them, understand their actual faith. Exercise and acts of affiance and resignation to God and all their dangers. So Psalm 56, verse 3, At what time I am afraid, David says, I will trust in you. Lord, if a storm come, I will make bold to shelter myself from it under your wings by faith. Look, 
His unbelief shuts the doors of all God's attributes and promises against us. So faith opens them all to the soul, and so much of the privilege invited to, which is the second thing. Number three, we have here a needful caution for the securing of this privilege to ourselves in evil times. Shut your doors about you. Or as the Syriac renders it, behind or after you. Care must be taken that no passage be left open for the devil to creep in after us and drive us out of our refuge. For so it falls out too often with God's people when they are at rest in God's name or promises. Satan creeps in by unbelieving doubts and puzzling objections and beats them out of their refuge back again into trouble. It is therefore of great concern in such times especially not to give place to the devil, as the phrase is in Ephesians 4 verse 17, but cleave to God by a resolved reliance. Lastly, we are to note with what arguments or motives they are pressed to betake themselves to this refuge. There are two found in the text, the one working upon their fear, the other upon their hope. That which works upon their fear is a supposition of a storm coming. The indignation of God will fall like a tempest. This is supposed in the text and plainly expressed in the words following, For the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 21 The other is fitted to work upon their hope. Though his indignation fall like a storm, yet it will not continue long. It shall be but for a moment. Better days and more comfortable dispensations will follow. From all which the general observation is this. Doctrine. That the attributes, promises, and providences of God are the chambers of rest and security in which his people are to hide themselves when they foresee the storms of his indignation coming upon the world. The name of the Lord, saith Solomon, is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. Proverbs 18, verse 10 and his attributes are his name, Exodus 34, verse 5. For by them he is known as a man is known by his name, and this his name is a strong tower for his people's security. Now what is the use and end of a tower in a city but to receive and secure the inhabitants when the outworks are beaten to the ground, the wall scaled, and the houses left desolate? And as it is here resembled to a tower, so in Isaiah 33, verse 16, it is shadowed out to us by a munition of rocks. His place of defense shall be a munition of rocks. How secure is that person that is environed with rocks on every side? Yea, you will say, but yet a rock is but a cold and barren refuge. Though other enemies cannot, yet hunger and thirst can invade and kill them there. No. In this rock, it's a storehouse of provision, as well as a magazine for defense. So it follows, bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. And sometimes it is resembled to us by the wings of a fowl, bred with much tenderness over her young for their defense. Psalm 57 verse 1 Yea, in the shadow of your wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. So Psalm 17 verse 8 Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. No part of the body has more guards upon it than the apple of the eye. God is as careful to preserve his people as men are to preserve their eyes. And he that touches them touches the apple of his eye. But we need not go from one metaphor to another to show you where the saint's refuge is in time of danger. You have a whole bundle of them lying together in that one scripture in Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower, where you find all kinds of defense, whether natural or artificial, under a pleasant variety of apparent metaphors ascribed to God for the security of his people. Now for the casting of this great point into as easy and profitable a method as I can, I shall resolve this general truth into these following propositions which are implied or expressed in the text and doctrine thence deduced. And the first is this. Proposition 1. That there are times and seasons appointed by God for the pouring out of his indignation upon the world. 
Number two, that God's own people are concerned in and ought to be affected with those judgments. Number three, that God has a special and particular care of his people in the days of his indignation. Number four, that God usually premonishes the world, especially his own people, of his judgments before they befall them. Number five, that God's attributes, promises, and providences are prepared for the security of his people in the greatest distresses that befall them in the world. That none but God's people are taken into those chambers of security or can expect a special protection in evil times, and then I shall apply the whole in the proper uses of it.